We're coming to the midpoint in a three-century review of the English monarchy. And it's truly a midpoint because with the heavy breathing, sweaty tutors behind us <laughs> and the uh, silly sort of asinine antics of the Hanoverians ahead of us, the Stuarts are smack in the middle. Venal, corrupt, sensual, perfect. <laughs> For some reason, uh, George Stewart does not um, call himself an artist. He calls himself a craftsman, an artisan. He feels that artists are only those people that uh, get a push from the inside that they have to do something. Well, um, I don't care what he thinks he is, but when it comes to artistic uh, expression and uh, um, perfection of form as a sculptor. Um, he is my absolute idol. The country at large did not observe these changes in monarchy with any great understanding. They were used to being under one kind of a prince or another, or a lord or a baron, somebody over them, and uh, it wasn't as, as uh, feudal and medieval as it was in, the, in Europe, but certainly the English were not. It was just another family come to collect the rents, you see. <laughs> in, when you look at them, you just accept the fact all these things come together, but you know, you can't go to Woolworths and say, I want eight gold buttons for the Tsar's uniform. And, and have them there. He makes the buttons, and even if you can't see the emblem on them, the emblem is there and it's exactly right. And uh, shoes and boots. I think he puts out a, a saucer of milk and a loaf of bread and the elves come and make the boots at night because they are so beautiful in the shoes. And he said, I just, you just make them like you make shoes, which of course is beyond me since I can't sew on a button. So I'm filled with uh, respect for him on what he has taught himself to make everything perfect. And it's perfect that you, it's so perfect you don't know it's perfect because it's just part of a whole. And it's part of the reason that they don't jar the eye is that all the details are there and in the right proportion. And that takes an amazing amount of work. So the fact that these are three quarter, uh, one quarter size, reduced to three quarters, uh, he doesn't think makes him remarkable, but when you look at the, the detail and the wonderful construction and the perspective and everything else that goes into making the figures, absolutely flawless and in perfect proportion. Uh, it was a perform a marriage and that was that. Henrietta, as they called her in England, was hurt. She was ignored, she was bitter, she hated Buckingham. Well, so did everybody else except the king. There was now a move in Parliament to have the Duke of Buckingham impeached for malfeasance in high office. He was amply qualified for such impeachment. <laughs> the king was furious and he prorogued the, the uh, Parliament. Well, uh, after the marriage of the French marriage had taken place, uh, Buckingham talked Charles into an invasion of France. Now, it's important that you understand this. We're still in the midst of a European push and shove between Protestants and Catholics. Catholic Spain and France had a large holding in what you call the Netherlands, or you don't call it that, that's what they called it then, Holland and Belgium. And they were trying to keep those areas out of the hands of the Protestants. They had invading armies in that part of the world trying to hold on to their hegemony, but the Protestants were making headway. England wanted to round up the Germanic parts of Europe, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and Germany. So it would be a good ploy, Buckingham told the king, if we go and save the Protestant French from Cardinal Richelieu. 
I went to the lecture and was immediately transfixed by him, just fascinated. It was like a, a great movie. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to him speak. Uh, he dramatized history in a way that made me feel like I was hearing gossip about the neighbors. Well, Parliament could hardly wait. They couldn't stand this. Well, right on top of this, Buckingham induced the king to give him another army for another try on the French. Are you following all this? Well, Buckingham was down on the seacoast enlisting the troops. When a man named John Felton, disgruntled, fired officer in the English army, asked to see the powerful duke. The duke was at breakfast. Felton entered. My lord, your grace. Yes, what is it? It is this, and he stabbed the duke. <laughs> he has you completely on, on a string the whole time of all those two hours. I don't know how he does it. In 1643, England, needing help, the parliamentary army, I'm talking about the parliamentary forces in London, needing help, sought a covenant with Scotland. If the Scots would come in and support them, this would surround the royalists, of course, then they would win. And the English faction promised that they would convert London and England, if successful, to the Presbyterian cause. The Scots came in. Well, the king's, the king's uh, cause was faltering because he was losing battles now, and one of the men he was losing battles to had been a civilian up until the war broke out. He'd been a very able member of the last parliament. He was a prosperous country squire. He was a radical, fundamentalist, religionist. He was not a Puritan, but very close to it. He was a lay preacher. His name was Oliver Williams. He took the name of Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell, seeing the debauchery in the army, <laughs> they swore and they drank. Would you believe it? <laughs> they smoked and they spat and they whored. Oh, horrors. So Cromwell, with his stern principles, designed his own army. They wouldn't do any of those things. I can't imagine what they did. I think the people who really enjoy arts, uh, the arts in general, uh, would have probably given anything to have had an interview with Van Gogh or an interview with Matisse or any of the old masters. And today, I feel very strongly that among us in this valley, in the Ojai Valley, lives an artist uh, by the name of George Stewart, who is of equal caliber of the great masters. And they lost all faith in them. Then they decided that the monarchy and the king had to be abolished if anything was to change. How were they going to do that? How are they going to get rid of a king? He was anointed by God, everybody said so. Well, they decided they would take a chance and try him for charges, treason among them. And, of course, that was against the law. There was no foundation for doing any of these things. The king said so. Everybody said so. But Cromwell and his cohorts said, we must chance this. We must prove to the English people that the king is every much as subject to the law as the rest of us. They tried him. It was like a court's martial. And a verdict of guilty was brought in. But now what are they going to do? Oh, all these judges, they never had such an experience. There was nothing in history like it. And now they were supposed to do what with him? Guilty, but this meant treason and that meant death. A death warrant had to be signed. Gentlemen, go and deliberate. Well, after they deliberated two days, Cromwell, we are told, went into their chamber and looked over their shoulders to see who had signed and who hadn't. Ah, sir, having trouble with your... <laughs> they signed. Oh, yes, it was signed. It was signed. And they all signed the death warrant. George Stewart uh, really strikes me as being a Renaissance man. Um, 
in addition to being so good at his art, so good at creating the historical figures, amazing detail and accuracy, uh, also being such an engaging speaker, which I think is an art in and of itself, to be able to tell a story so well, which is what so many artists are trying to do, writers, filmmakers, um, they're all trying to tell a story, but he can stand up there, just one man, and engage an audience for two hours telling stories. It's quite amazing. When the king, heavily guarded, stepped out onto the platform, he saw that they had planned one final humiliation for him. He had always conducted himself with such elegance and such dignity, and during the trial, his stammer had left him. He defended himself eloquently. They, his persecutors, wanted to see him humbled. In this day and age, when trials took place and a person was condemned to death by beheading, if they were, and somehow they die between the trial and the execution, the corpse was beheaded anyway, pro forma. And they had a low block. You laid the corpse out and you put the block under the neck and you cut its head off so that you carried through the execution plan. This is what they were going to do to Charles. They had a low block for corpses. He would have to get down on his hands and knees and grovel on the floor. He saw this. He drew back. They had chains ready. They were going to load him with chains and drag him over. Everybody was watching. Everybody was watching. Dark and gloomy and thundering, rumbling. He pulled himself together said a few words to the religious who was accompanying him, gave his personal effect, so on. Went over to the executioner, paid him. You always pay the executioner. <laughs> the executioner was masked, by the way, which was unusual. Masked to hide his identity. Gave him his coins and said, strike when I hold forth my hands. He knelt, got down on the floor, put his head on the block, and thrust forward his hands. And the axe fell. At that very moment, the sun shone through the clouds on to the king. And the crowd said, oh, oh, an act of God. Charles the martyr was born. To the royalist cause, he is a martyr to this very day. But there wasn't an outbreak, there wasn't a riot, there wasn't a revolution or a rebellion. The Cromwellians had succeeded. They had proved that the king was a subject to law. And like most artists, he is never quite satisfied and is always changing or refurbishing or, or he finds, he's always doing research and he finds that uh, uh, one of the Stuarts was in mourning for his father, the one that was beheaded, for uh, years. So he was dressed very flamboyantly, and immediately he changed into mourning clothes, even though the figure had been shown for many years, because that's what was correct in his research. And he just happened to run across it. Charles Stuart, Charles II, there in yellow, um, <clears throat> was not um, a tiny, inauspicious presence. His father, his father was diminutive. Charles was six feet two. He was dark. He was part uh, uh, French, of course, his mother being a French princess and all of that, went back to Italian blood. So he was uh, quite a prepossessing man. He was narrow-legged, they said. That means tall and slender. And he was Saturnine. He had spent a bitter youth, rejected. His father had been murdered. He and his mother had been exiled. They'd run around penniless, having to plead on their relatives. And most of it done pleading with the French monarch, Louis XIV, his cousin, uh, his mother being the aunt of the reigning king of France. Louis and Charles were first cousins. And it was very embarrassing. Now he was back. He had the normal feelings of revenge on his father's murderers and all, but he didn't do anything. His brother, James, wanted to go out and kill all of the court that had sentenced his father and the rest of them. Nope, nope. 
They did set up uh, the Clarendon Code. Edward Hyde, who followed them faithfully all through exile, and the rest of it was the chancellor now, and he had set up a code that uh, did place certain penalties on some of the people who had been the worst, in the eyes of the restored king, worst malefactors in the, in the revolution that had preceded him. But other than that, it was a benign transfer of power. Now, Parliament had seized the purse strings, which effectively castrates the monarch. He couldn't, even though he was titular commander of the army, he couldn't do anything because he couldn't hire the soldiers to do it. So in effect, Parliament had real control. They had the control of the military and the taxing power. But there was endless patronage to bestow by the monarch. And the city of London began to flourish. The theaters and the whorehouses opened. In other words, our lives were just the way we wanted them. <laughs> We are dealing with a man who has dedicated his entire life for his art or for his work or for what he has created. We're talking to somebody who created over 300 figures. And as you will witness in this documentary, how painstaking to even do one of these figures. And those figures are for us to enjoy in this lifetime and for many, many generations to come. And this sense of dedication I have no idea where it comes from. I have no idea what inspires somebody. That inspiration must come from some different plane that I do not understand personally. As things were getting underway, and by the way, I should say, Charles brought with him uh, a handful of his mistresses. 
Um, uh, Parliament suggested that His Majesty might consider marriage. Bully, said Charles. He was all for marriages. Why not? A marriage was arranged for him. The Portuguese princess, or infant, Catarina de Paganzu, she's not shown here, she was a small, dark, pious Catholic. Here we go again. <laughs> Apparently, Parliament agreed. So much for Parliament's holding a line. At any rate, Catherine de Braganzu has had been raised up to that time as if she were a nun. She had never seen the bright lights or the big city. She had certainly never seen the seraglio that her husband lived in the midst of. <laughs> All his demoiselles de la noire, ladies of the evening, were appointed her ladies-in-waiting. <laughs> she swallowed this one because she must have been a perfect idiot. People with total power do amazing things. And he's really, I would say, basically interested in power and the uses and abuses of it, and also learning from our mistakes, which people need to look as history is a living thing. And uh, when he gives a talk, all those things that have been facts that were stuffed down your throat in school, in that uh, stuff and regurgitate system we were all brought up on, and then you spit it all out at exa exam time. And you hear him talk about these events, and you'll say, that's why that happened. And it all falls into place because he looks on history as things and acts that people did, not events that happened on a certain day. And the following year, Charles, the second Charles Stuart, suffered a stroke, a massive stroke. Well, he probably, because he was a very vigorous man, even though a certain amount of VD, he had venereal disease, probably syphilis, and, um, and he had, uh, of course, womanized and uh, lived high, degenerated his natural robust physique. But I think the thing that killed him were the doctors were called in. Anybody a doctor? <laughs> well, 17th century medicine was the one thing that had not progressed. It had gone backwards. In the Muslim world, they knew all kinds of medical science, but it had never penetrated England. So the glisters and purges were applied or inserted and uh, dead pigeons were rubbed over his feet and leeches were placed on his body and he was made to guzzle all kinds of putrefaction uh, and so on. Oh, of course, this wasted him away completely. But it took nearly a week, at the end of which Charles was able to whisper to his brother, well, I apologize for being so long a dying. <laughs> yes, he was nearly tortured to death. And in the final hours, James said, Charles, do you want a priest? And Charles said, yes. James had a priest just out in the hall already. The priest was brought in. The king confessed, was given absolution, and administered extreme unction. Charles Stewart died a Roman Catholic. We're very proud and happy to have George Stewart's historic figures at the Ventura County Museum of History and Art. We're also very happy that he gives his talks here. I believe, and many others believe, that George Stewart deserves to be recognized as a national treasure. The Stuarts had provided England with a very essential part of her growing pains. Constitutional history would not have moved forward without them. They were everything needed as a foil to uh, play off your growing democratic tendencies. They were corrupt, as I say, and venal and duplicitous. They were pro-French, and they were basically Catholic. And that was all English needed to work against, to build a beginning representative society with a monarchy that was uh, in title only, 
virtually powerless. They also were to lay the groundwork for the colonials which had left England in their reign to go to the new world, be set up in the colonies, and whose lesson about a government being responsible to the subjects, a constitution that was written down so none could confuse it, the separation of powers, and all the things that two generations later would come under discussion in the 18th century. So we can thank the Stuarts for their contribution to constitutional history.